Hi, I'm Vanessa Wins. I am Canopy's environmental educator. Canopy is a nonprofit that is based in Palo Alto, and we work throughout the Mid Peninsula to plant, advocate for, and educate about trees. We're here today on a beautiful sunny day in Cornelius Bowl Park in Palo Alto, and we are going to do a wellness tree walk. So to set up the wellness tree walk, um, you're more than welcome to watch this video at home or bring it to another park, but actually it's ideal if you can load up this video on your phone, bring your phone with you, and go to the park and do this with me, because not only will I be sharing certain facts about the trees with you, but I'm also gonna walk you through certain wellness activities that we can do together. So we're starting off here in a grove of coast redwoods. Um, you might be able to see the coloration on the bark uh, from which it got its name, redwood. Um, it is actually California's official state tree and one of the 10 most commonly planted natives in California. Something that you'll notice um, is that at the bottom of the trunk right here, there are these little like shoots coming out and that is actually part of this same tree. So what this is called is suckering. Um, and it's actually all of these little shoots that are coming out are genetically identical to the main tree. And when left to grow, it will form like a crown all the way around this trunk. So if you let them grow, they will grow into trees, um, but it's common to just kind of cut it down at the very bottom here. Um, there's three different types of redwoods in California. There's this one, the coast redwood. There's also a giant sequoia. And the third one is called a dawn redwood. Um, you'll notice that the coast redwood has this like this green, dark green foliage. The dawn redwood is interesting because these leaves will turn color in the fall, like certain deciduous trees do, um, the trees that lose their leaves, and it turns to this kind of golden color and will also lose its leaves. We're going to leave the grove of coast redwoods now. We're going to walk along the creek here to our next tree. As you're walking and before you change anything, I want you to just check in with yourself and your pacing. Um, a lot of the times when we're walking places, we have things on our mind, we have places to go, and we tend to quicken our pace um, in step with our mind. So a really important first step for this wellness tree walk is just to check in with yourself and see how you're feeling today. Maybe you're a little bit rushed. Maybe you've got a lot of things on your mind. Um, try, if you can, to observe what is around you and to let the stillness that is here help slow your pace down. So keep that in mind as we transition between all of the different trees on the walk, that just every now and then come back, check in. If you're going really quickly, just maybe slow down a little bit and enjoy it a little bit more. I've just walked past the Redwood Grove and now I'm going to take us to this little area here by Manadero Creek to look at our next tree. This beautiful tree is a coast live oak. This is actually a California native um, and it has a ton of ecosystem benefits. There's a lot of different species that rely on this tree. Um, the word native, we said this tree is a native. We also mentioned that the coast redwoods are natives as well. What that means is that they have adapted and grown in this area for years and years, for over millennia. And there's a benefit to that. If you've been in a place for a very, very long time, you adapt to that area and you have these adaptations which help you thrive and live in that area better. So the counterpoint to native um, is simply non-native. And you might be wondering, well, what, what is a non-native? Is that even problematic? Um, there's a lot of debate about this because a non-native, which is just a plant that's taken from a different region, different area, 
and is sent and grown in California, for example, um, can turn into something that we call an invasive. And basically an invasive plant is just one that thrives too well. And the problem with that is that if a non-native invasive plant is doing too well, it is actually taking resources which the native plants need to survive. And the native plants are associated with a web of different interconnected relationships that support the ecosystem here. So birds, bugs, bees, um, caterpillars, all sorts of different insects and animals rely on native species and have co-adapted and evolved with these species and therefore it is more beneficial to have these natives here. Um, the coast live oak is a very beneficial native. In, this, in the same park actually there is an invasive species called a glossy privet. There is another nonprofit that works in this area called Grassroots Ecology and they actually have teams of high school students that work to remove these invasives for the reasons that we talked about earlier. The coast live oak is interesting because its name, its scientific name, is Quercus agrifolia. There's some speculation though that that was actually a mistranscription, that somebody had looked at a word that was written and wrote it down incorrectly. Um, the word agrifolia really doesn't mean anything, but I'm gonna come to the camera and I'm gonna show you its leaf and tell you why there's speculation that it was named incorrectly. So let me make sure that the leaf is in the frame here. All right, you can see at the edge of the leaf these spiky points. Um, while agrifolia really doesn't mean anything, aquifolia means spiky leaf. And so there's speculation that somebody had just read that incorrectly and wrote it down wrong. We're gonna stop at this tree for a wellness exercise. This nice branch down here is a beautiful place to pause. We're kind of off the trail. Um, and you can just lean up against it or sit down on this tree. But take some time for yourself right now. I'm first gonna guide you through just some deep breaths to help get you centered. And then we're gonna do a sensory exercise. So get comfortable if you want to. Take off your shoes. And I'm gonna count out the breaths with you. Um, breathing exercises are really helpful. If we're feeling very stressed, we tend to breathe more shallowly and that is not beneficial for our cells which need oxygen. So right now when you are breathing, you can even put a hand over your stomach if you'd like to, to make sure that you are breathing profoundly into the bottom of your lungs and I will count out the breaths with you. So inhale for four counts. One, two, three, four. Hold the breath. One, two, three, four. And release. One, two, three, four. Now you can count in your head and do it with me for two more breaths. As you're breathing, check in with your body. Sometimes we carry a lot of tension up in our shoulders or throughout our neck. As you're breathing, breathe in. And as you exhale, try and release that tension. Once you've finished the breathing exercise, stay here for a little while. Don't rush, don't go too quickly. We're gonna do a sensory exercise. Um, something that happens when we're too much in our head is that we're not aware of our own bodies or what's going on around us. And a really helpful tool to help us recenter is to kind of take note of the sensory inputs. So as you're here, starting with sight, just notice to yourself, you don't have to say it out loud, but just take note of two things that you see. For example, I see a creek and I see a grove of trees growing beside the creek. Then switch to two things that you hear. Um, if possible, try and make them natural sounds. So I can hear right now some birds chirping. And if I'm very quiet, I can actually hear 
some of the water bubbling through the creek. Um, tap into what you feel. I feel a light breeze that's blowing on my face and I also feel the steady trunk of the tree behind me. Um, the rivets in the trunk as I put my hands onto it. And lastly, check in with what you with what you smell. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> with what you smell. So this one might be a little bit harder, but just maybe you notice these in your deep breaths, or maybe you want to take a couple more breaths. Um, I noticed that kind of wet, leafy smell probably coming up from the creek. It's hard to pull out another one, but it really, it kind of just smells like being out in nature. It smells like damp soil and like leaves. So once you're done with that, you can put your shoes back on if you took those off. Um, you can dwell here for a little bit longer and then we'll head over to our next tree. While you might not recognize this tree, you will likely recognize what we get from it. This behind me is a black walnut tree. California has excellent growing conditions for walnuts and actually grows 99% of all of the walnuts consumed across the United States and two thirds of the walnuts consumed internationally. In fact, there are certain places in the Central Valley of California that can grow up to 50,000 tons of walnuts per year, which is a pretty phenomenal number. Walnuts are incredible because they are actually a really great protein source. Um, this tree behind me is a black walnut, but there's different species of walnuts. And the one that we typically eat is from a different species that I will show you later on the walk called an English walnut. The reason that we prefer that one is actually because the walnuts that we get from English walnut tend to be a bit larger and sweeter and easier to crack open. Whereas the black walnut, you can eat it, but it's a lot more work and it kind of has more of an earthy tone. So one thing to show you about walnuts here is this is a branch that I have taken off of the tree. Um, they're, the walnuts actually come in something that looks like this, which you might not be familiar with seeing. This external part, um, the green that you see is called the husk. We, when we get the walnuts, we break open the husk and inside of that, before we even get to the walnut, is the shell. You might be used to seeing this because it is sometimes sold in the shell. And then once we crack the shell, we get to the actual walnut. A fun fact is that we call it a nut, a walnut, but is in fact actually the seed of this tree. And this entire um, thing is the fruit, which you might not be used to thinking of it as a fruit, but botanically speaking, that is what it is. And I will walk a little bit closer and bring the camera closer to the tree to show you our next wellness exercise um, that we will use the leaves of this tree for. I'm here at the base of the walnut tree and you'll notice that there's not a lot of other plants or trees growing in this area. That could just be because of how it was planted kind of in this open field. But it also could be because walnuts are a special case. Um, not all trees do this, but walnuts practice something called allelopathy. What that means is that they will send chemicals out into the ground and those chemicals will poison other plants that are trying to grow in the same area. 
the reason that walnuts do this is so that they have a competitive advantage because if other plants aren't growing then they are not taking the resources that the walnut tree wants to survive um, before we do the exercise, I want to share a couple of studies with you about uh, just scenes of nature. So a lot of times we think about the benefits of nature as, you know, being outdoors, but there's actually some interesting studies that show that even just scenes of nature, just looking at pictures of nature or watching clips of nature on your computer at home can be beneficial. Um, one of the studies, it was conducted in a hospital and that study had two groups of patients. For one of the patients, they were in a hospital room where their view outdoors was kind of to a cityscape or just a brick wall, nothing natural. The other group of patients had a view out to trees and to, to natural areas. And they compared the healing rates between the two groups. And the group that had a view out onto nature healed better, um, healed quicker, and had less incidences than did the group that only had a view out onto city states. So that's pretty powerful. Um, you might know, you might be familiar with this because dentist office like to tap into this. So knowing that it's a stressful case for some people to go to the dentist, you know, sometimes you're in the chair, you get reclined and they'll have this beautiful natural poster for you to look at because studies do show that it will help calm us. Another study actually shows that just 40 seconds, it's called a micro break, just taking 40 seconds when you're really stressed, you're feeling overwhelmed, to look at a natural scene can help reset you, um, help you focus and kind of decrease the stress markers. So I'm gonna back out of the frame and we're gonna pan up this tree for the wellness exercise. Um, as you're looking at the tree, just really just enjoy, look at the leaves, See how they're fluttering. Maybe take some deep breaths in right now. Listen to what is around you. Studies actually show just taking breaks like this, observing things in nature, especially things with motion, um, are very beneficial to us, like running streams or the fluttering of leaves um, tend to be very calming to look at. So just take a few moments to enjoy that. I'm here in this little recessed area right off of the main trail and I want to draw your attention to these two plants right here. Um, it actually it looks like one plant but these are actually two plants that are growing together. The tree that I want to draw your attention to first is on the right hand side. Um, this is called Toyon, also pronounced Toyon. Uh, the word comes from the Ohlone peoples that were indigenous to this area and that still live throughout this region. Um, the term Ohlone encompasses actually a lot of different tribes, but it's very important to remember that the land that we are on currently um, was actually stolen land, and the historical context is important to remember. Um, Toyan, interestingly, is also the only California native plant that is known by an indigenous common name, 
What a common name is, is what we just typically refer to a plant as. So plants will have a scientific name, which is composed of the Latin species and genus, and it will have a common name, which just everyday people use. It is intertwined, though, with something called poison oak, and that is this plant right here. I am not touching it because, as the name tells you, it is poisonous, and touching it will actually cause, it can cause skin rashes and a lot of just nasty irritation, so you want to avoid it. One way that you can tell it's poison oak is you see that the leaves are growing in, in threes here, and there's a little rhyme that it says, leaves of three, let it be, or leaves of three, don't touch me. So just every time you think of that, remember this. Also poison ivy is kind of the same thing. So just stay away from the poisonous leaves of three. This section also brings up an interesting idea, which is what even counts as a tree? So I said, Toyon was a tree, but on the other hand, poison oak, is that a tree? Um, first of all, it's not even an oak. So uh, we saw the coast live oak earlier, and that is an oak tree. Although this has the same name, it's not related. Um, it's just because somebody saw that it looked a little bit similar and thought to name it that. So its common name can actually be kind of deceptive. And most people don't consider it a tree. It's considered kind of a shrub. Um, and some people even question whether Toyon is a tree because Certain people think the tree kind of has to have what we think of a tree typically having, which is this single uh, woody stem or trunk that grows up into kind of a larger plant. Some people think this does count, in fact, because it has a woody stem. It can grow up to 20 feet tall, but those who think that it doesn't count say that, you know, it has so many different stems and it's not a singular trunk, and therefore maybe it doesn't count as a tree. So I'll leave it up to you to debate that. I'm on the dirt trail just across the tree that we looked at, and we are at this area, which initially might not look like much, but let's take a closer look and we'll find some interesting things. You might be wondering why there are all of these dead trees left lying around and why they haven't been cleaned up. They're actually here intentionally, and what you're looking at right now um, are little holes that were either bored by some kind of insect or perhaps a woodpecker. Um, a fun fact about the acorn woodpecker is that they tend to find standing dead trees and they will make holes um, larger than this and they will put the acorns that they've scavenged into those holes, they'll wedge it in and they'll even take their beaks and transfer acorns that are too small to fit in one hole into another hole just to make sure it's a tight fit because they're actually protecting that food source from squirrels who as you know also eat acorns. So let's come over to this next log here and see evidence of another creature. I'm no expert on insects, but you can see these lines all across the bark were left behind by some kind of insect. Um, I suspect it might be something like a termite, um, and they leave this kind of beautiful design here on the tree. And the very last thing I want to show you in this area actually comes from these oak trees here. So you might be wondering what on earth these are. They kind of look like dried fruits, they kind of just look like something very strange and sci-fi. But what these are are galls actually. So the tree that is behind us here has some of these galls on them, actually quite a few. Um, it is actually not something like a fruit. It's not something that the tree grows for itself or to attract birds or anything like that. It is a relationship that the tree has with a wasp. So what the wasp does is the wasp will come to the tree and it will lay its eggs. And while it also lays its eggs in the tree, it injects the tree with a hormone that mimics the tree's own growth hormone. 
So the tree gets this signal, oh, I have to grow in this specific area. And what it grows are these. And then the wasp actually wants this. Um, that is the whole advantage of doing this because this, this structure will grow around its young and its young will have not only protection from predators, but a food source for when they hatch. You can see these tiny holes all around it. Those are locations where the young wasps that have hatched have exited. So they've eaten their way out, relying on this food source. They've lived in this safely, were protected from predators, and now they safely exit and live in the world. Um, galls are not harmful to trees, unless your tree is completely overtaken. Um, they just drop like these ones did from the tree after the wasps have exited. So I like this area because it brings to mind that, you know, we might look at a zone like this and think, well, you know, it's, it's not that interesting. Those trees aren't that fantastic. But there's so much life that an area like this supports, even in this dead wood, this dead material on the ground. Um, before we go on to the next tree, I recommend that you maybe sit on one of these logs here and just take a moment to think about kind of like how all these insects rely upon nature. What are certain ways that you rely upon nature um, that you are grateful for? Dwelling on gratitude is a very effective practice to point out what's really positive in our lives, especially if things feel very negative. Um, there is a woman at Yale University, Dr. Lori Santos, who teaches a course called The Science of Well-Being. And one of the things that she recommends in this course, which by the way is Yale's most attended course in its entire history, is to spend time and, and think daily, if you can, about things that you are grateful for in your own life. Because no matter how many things are stressful or, or going wrong, seemingly, there's always something that you can find to be grateful for. This tree behind me is an incense cedar. Nowadays, we use mechanical pencils or we just type things out on our computers or iPads or whatever. But back in the day when pencils were actually made from wood, incense cedar was one of the trees that was used for that production. I really love this tree because it has a beautiful smell. So 
if you are here, you can gently take off some of the leaves and try and break it in half. And if you smell it, it has this very strong, aromatic, kind of pungent smell, but it's very pleasant. Um, and it's something actually that is chemically produced by the trees for the benefit of the trees. So um, trees will produce something called phytoncides, and those are compounds that the tree releases out in the air, kind of as defense for itself. So although sometimes they smell really good to us, some of these compounds will actually be very off-putting for predators who might want to chew on trees like this or you know, eat it or harm it in some way. But luckily for us, the phytoncides actually have a benefit for humans. There have been studies that show that breathing in the phytoncides from trees by walking in forests and being in the presence of trees actually has a couple of really cool benefits. One is that it will lower our stress indicators. So it actually lowers levels of our stress hormone cortisol. It lowers our blood pressure and our pulse, bringing us back into a sense of calm and ease. And it also boosts our white blood cell count. Um, white blood cells are really important for our, our immune system function, so which is vital for our health. So these trees actually quite literally help keep us healthy. So for this exercise, um, just put yourself at the bottom of the tree. And as you take a couple of deep breaths like we did earlier, think about this reciprocal relationship. You know that we breathe in oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide and trees have the opposite cycle. So they take in the carbon dioxide that we exhale and they release oxygen for us. So take a couple of seconds here and take deep breaths thinking about this relationship that we have. I've walked a little ways down the main bike path and we are actually going to go off on this little path to my right to see our next tree. So I said this was one tree. The fun fact here is that this is actually two trees that are attached together. So this is a process called grafting where you can actually take the bottom part of a tree that is growing in an area cut it off and you can attach a different kind of tree to the top of it and it will grow the fruits of whatever the attached tree is. So the bottom of this tree is a black walnut like the one that we saw earlier and the reason that bottom is used is because it grows really well here. So the roots are well established and it is a healthy tree. The top part is an English walnut and that's the walnut that I told you earlier is the one that we commonly eat because it has a better flavor. So that's the reason we're kind of getting the best of both worlds in this grafting process by having a really stable root area from one tree, whereas we're enjoying the fruits of another tree.
I've continued further down the bike path and we're almost at the end of the park right now. The tree behind me is the next tree that we're going to look at. This is called mountain mahogany. Um, you might be familiar with what we typically think of uh, for mahogany, which is kind of a fine wood that we use for furniture. Interestingly, this is another one of those cases where somebody gave it that common name and it's actually not related, kind of like how poison oak is not an actual oak and it's not related to the coast live oak that we saw before. So similarly, this mountain mahogany is not an actual mahogany. It is actually part of the rose family. So if your family or if you've ever seen rose bushes, this tree is in the same family. And I think this tree is really interesting because its Latin name or its scientific name um, is Cercocarpus, that is the genus. And Cercocarpus comes from the Greek and it means tailed fruit. So I'm gonna come closer to the camera now I've collected a couple of the seeds and I'm going to show you what they look like. All right, so taking this one as an example, this is actually the winged seed or the winged fruit from the Cercocarpus, this mountain mahogany. And you'll see this part, you can go up and, and touch it if it's the right season, it's actually quite soft and fuzzy. And the reason that it has this, you might guess, is actually for the dispersal mechanism. So the way that these trees are dispersed, this feathery part kind of catches onto the wind and it floats off and it lands on the ground. And this point here helps the seed kind of like, it's almost like an arrow. So it lands vertically onto the ground and with rain or with being trampled on by animals, it will get ground into the ground to make sure that it has a firm hold before it grows. Um, I'm gonna come back into the camera now And it's interesting because this is just one of many, many mechanisms that plants have to spread their seeds. Um, there are seeds that are spread best by wind. Sometimes they're spread through water. There's some seeds that kind of explode off of the tree. The trees also like to have their seeds carried a bit away from them. So they're not competing with the new trees that are growing. And this is just one really cool example of a seed dispersal mechanism. Behind me is the last tree on our walk. I've simply crossed over the bike path from the mountain mahogany that we looked at, and I am at a silver dollar eucalyptus. There's actually a few of them that are scattered on the side of the bike trail. Um, the light right now is hitting it very beautifully, and you might be able to tell how it got its name, silver dollar. The leaves have this kind of silvery tone. I've talked a lot about certain health benefits or actual like physical, physiological benefits that we get from trees. But one benefit that you might not immediately consider is just for the aesthetic or the beauty value. This tree specifically, the branches, the small branches are preferenced for wedding bouquets and are often used in conjunction with, you know, white flowers, perhaps roses. This is a good tree to end on also because we talked earlier with the incense cedar about the phytoncides, which if you remember were those compounds that trees release that actually have benefits to us. Well, eucalyptus um, has an oil that comes out of the leaves and we sometimes take that oil and make an essential oil out of it. And a phytoncide is actually a kind of volatile essential oil. Um, this the essential oil that we typically get from eucalyptus is not from specifically the silver dollar eucalyptus, but I do have a bottle. Um, the smell, if you're familiar with it, is very unique. People diffuse it in diffusers, actually, inside of their homes. And what it does is it can help clear your sinuses, relieve allergy symptoms. It's also sometimes present in 
wellness formulas or cough drops that people take to like soothe your throat. So if you're looking for a way, if you can't really go outdoors much and you're looking for a way to bring some of those health benefits of the outdoors in, maybe you can think about getting a diffuser and diffusing some of your favorite essential oils. I'm gonna walk off screen now and we're gonna end the wellness tree walk just with the view of this beautiful silver dollar eucalyptus um, here in the sunlight. And you can also, it's a nice windy day so we can enjoy the sound as well. Thank you for joining me on this wellness tree walk. We've come to the end of the walk, but I just wanna remind you that wellness is not a one and done activity. So whenever you feel like you could use a boost in focus or a decrease in stress, I want you to try and think of nature and nature walks and being around trees as maybe just one tool in your toolbox that you can pull out um, to help you come back, feel more centered, and feel more focused. So feel free to reference this video however much you like, and feel free also, we just did one loop out of this park, feel free to also go back and explore the trail that continues further into the park. Thank you for joining me.